Did you know there are horses that can jump higher than the average house? We'll talk more about that later. Did you know that God does not need us? Well, that's kind of blunt, isn't it? I mentioned that in a sermon last week, and nobody in the congregation reacted to it, so I guess I wasn't blunt enough. Maybe Paul was blunt enough. It was Acts 17, verse 24 and 25, when he said, The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. Like Paul, deep down, we all know that that's true. It stands to reason God created us and everything else. And Jesus is that same God. And we know from Matthew 20, verse 28, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. In an article in Table Talk magazine, entitled, God Doesn't Need Us. Matthew Barrett explains it like this. Biblical worship is due to God, not because he needs us, but because we need him. When we lift up our voices, God receives our worship. Yet we should never think that in worshiping God, we somehow give him what he otherwise would lack as if he needed us to make him complete. Since I don't have time to continue on this path, I will assume that you agree with Paul and me and thousands of theologians smarter than me that God does not need us. Now we turn to today's text where Paul calls the elders together for instruction and starting with Acts 20, verse 19, Paul says, I served the Lord with great humility. Paul said, I served the Lord. And the Lord said, I came to serve, not to be served. Was Paul being disobedient? I don't think so. It's very clear in the original Greek language, Jesus came to serve diakoneo, which means to minister to, either physically or mentally. It's the word from which we get the word deacon. The Lord, Paul, excuse me, Paul served the Lord. Deluo, which means to be a slave, to be owned by, or to be totally obedient to. So Paul was obeying, he was being obedient to Christ's command to make disciples, baptize them, and teach them. The language of love for God is obedience, duluo. So Paul was obeying the greatest commandments. And by ministering to Jews and G Gentiles, diakoneo, he was loving his neighbor. And that's the second greatest commandment. Paul knew what he was saying. We just didn't hear it the way he meant it. By the way, that's the same reason some horses can jump higher than the average house. It's because the average house can't jump at all. As Paul begins his instruction to the elders from Ephesus, we can now understand that there reside in Paul both types of service. I served the Lord with great humility and with tears and in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents. First, he says, I served the Lord, making it clear by his use of the verb duluo that he means he obeyed the commandments of the Lord to go to the ends of the earth and make disciples. Then second, he intends to explain just what that servitude to the Lord means as you serve 
diakoneo, to minister or to be a deacon to others. It's this dual role of being servant and server simultaneously that Paul has mastered. And now he is going to give us a how-to course on the characteristics of serving the Lord. John Piper, Chancellor of Bethlehem College and Seminary, identified at least 13 characteristics of serving the Lord. I will summarize some of the high points as we work through the passage. First, Paul says, I serve the Lord with great humility. We must submit to the will of God. As Piper said, God has absolute rights over your life that he can do with you as he pleases and that he has absolute authority to tell you what is best for you. And that's just fine with you. Isaiah 45 verse 9 says, Woe to those who quarrel with their maker, those who are nothing but potsherds among the potsherds on the ground. Does the clay say to the potter, What are you making? Does your work say the potter has no hands? Second, Paul served the Lord with tears. In that Paul doesn't specify why he shed tears. I'm sure there are many reasons. Physical pain, emotional pain, fear, sickness, even tears of joy. I believe the point is there will be tears. To paraphrase Piper, serving the Lord in any capacity in the church of God will mean tears because it will mean getting involved in people's struggles for faith and hope and truth and holiness. Third, there will be testing. There are trials. Jesus certainly made it clear. In Matthew 10, verse 16, he says, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. And Paul, in Ephesians 6, verses 11 and 12, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So that, was verse 19. I served the Lord with great humility and with tears and in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents. Piper summarizes verse 19 like this. He says, I want to call you to serve the Lord in these ways. With humility, be utterly yielded to the Lord, be submissive to his absolute rights to control your life. Be willing clay in the potter's hands and be a debtor to all people. Don't dwell on what people owe you. Think about how the grace of God makes you a debtor to all. With tears, if you are shedding them, be comforted. You are in good company with Paul. And if you are not, Perhaps you should look for someone who needs you, or perhaps pray that God could help you see what is at stake in the battle for faith and hope and holiness. With testing, if you are being tried, then hear the word of James. Count it all joy, brothers, then you fall into various trials knowing that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and that steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Paul continues his instruction on how to serve the Lord in verse 20. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly from house to house. John Piper says the next characteristic is courage, but I think there's a stronger word needed. 
Here's what Paul said. I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you. Some translations say I did not shrink back. Some say I kept back nothing or I held back nothing. In any case, it means I had the guts to tell you the truth. This is of critical importance for us in today's anything goes culture. Paul is calling us to stand for, firm and have the guts to teach the biblical truth, regardless of public opinion. We serve the Lord when we read the Bible and teach the truth. Here, here's some biblical truth. God created two genders. Marriage is between one man and one woman. Live-ins and casual sex are not acceptable. And God designed pregnancy to end with birth. And here's a current event example about having guts. I saw this, this just, just a couple days ago in Dr. Jim Dennison's daily article. He says, Joe Biden that Joe Biden, is a lifelong Roman Catholic, a, a commitment he has made public on numerous occasions across his long career in public servants. He and his wife regularly attend Mass. However, he is also a strong supporter of abortion on demand. When the presidential candidate was campaigning in South Carolina last weekend, he attended Sunday Mass at St. Anthony Catholic Church. However, the priest later stated that he had to refuse Holy Communion to the former vice president. The priest explained, Holy Communion signifies we are one with God, each other, and the church. Our actions should reflect that. Any public figure who advocates for abortion places himself or herself outside of church teaching. The backlash against the priest was swift and severe by the liberal groups and the press. Do you think that was easy for that priest to do? It takes guts to do what's right, even when it's not popular. Next, Paul says that these truths are to be taught and proclaimed publicly. This house of worship in which we worship is a wonderful place where we can preach and teach and question without fear of judgment. In the language of our culture, this is a safe place. Paul says, I have taught you publicly and from house to house. We are blessed to know the gospel truth and we are commanded to share it freely, widely, and with boldness. Then in verse 21, Paul says, I have declared to both Jews and Greeks, we must proclaim the whole unvarnished truth publicly and without prejudice. It's not our job to decide who will and will not receive the grace of God through faith. As we read several weeks ago in Acts 15, verse 9, And he made no distinction between us and them, but cleansed their hearts by faith. It may surprise you to learn that Muslims are converting to Christianity in record numbers. In spite of the fact that conversion from Islam is a capital offense in many traditional Muslim communities. So, does a chat with an unbelieving friend or neighbor seem out of the question? Finally, Paul gets to the most important lesson of all. All people are equal, and for salvation they have one choice. He said, they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. Not only is that Paul's point with the elders, it is the overarching point of the book of the Acts of the Apostles. In closing, let's review a few verses that we read earlier in the book of Acts. 
Acts 3, verse 19, Repent therefore and turn again that your sins may be blotted out. Acts 5, verse 31, God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Act 8, 22, Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. Acts 11, verse 18, When they heard this, they were silenced, and they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance unto life. And Acts 17, verse 30, The times of ignorance of God God overlooked, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent. May God bless us as we strive to serve him. Amen.